Good morning and welcome to Ballon Baptist Online. I hope that you've been enjoying the last of the summer sunshine this week. It's been such a treat to have the warmth coming through my window as I've been working. This week, Steve is continuing our series on Prosper and will be encouraging us to think about tables. Thankfully, not our times tables, because I was never any good at that, but more that the tables we sit at, whether that's for work, eating with family, or spending time with God. Jim will also be leading us in communion, so now's the time to prepare your own table so you can enjoy this meal together with us. Hello, Ballon Baptist Church. Good morning. Um, Jim asked if I'd do a little reading this morning um, and also share a little bit about my front line. A lot of you probably know what I do already, but I work as a proofreader, editor and designer for Judicial Office, which is a satellite of the Ministry of Justice. And it is sort of like the civil service for judges, so it supports the judiciary. Uh, The work I do is uh, working on documents and training materials for judiciary. Um, It is quite isolated. I work from home and everything I do is using a a mouse and a keyboard. But I have a lot of contact with colleagues by, you know, email and uh, video conference and so on. Um, And that's really come into its own this year because suddenly all my colleagues who are normally office based are working from home as well. Um, Jim also suggested that I show you where I work. So um, what you're seeing at the moment is a carefully edited version of the room, so all the models are are out of sight, but I'm going to spoil that now by showing you my actual workstation. If you're of a nervous disposition, please look away because it's not going to be pretty, but I tend to work in a bit of a muddle and here it is. Um, So that is the workstation. There's a box on it at the moment because I'm going to use that to prop up the camera. But um, it's never going to appear in Vogue or Homes and Gardens, but it works for me, and that's what matters. Anyway, today's reading is from Psalm 30, and it's verses 1 to 5. So here goes. I will exalt you, Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths and did not let my enemies gloat over me. Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. You, Lord, brought me up from the realm of the dead. You spared me from going down to the pit. Sing the praises of the Lord, his faithful people. Praise his holy name. For his anger lasts only a moment, but his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Have you ever watched that uh, TV programme, Come Dine With Me? You have four contestants, uh, and they each take it in turns to host a dinner party at their house. And they're judged by the, uh, the other contestants, judged on the quality of their food, uh, judged on their hosting ability, and judged on the, the atmosphere that they set in their home. It's one of those programs that sparked that question that's so popular in conversations actually around dinner parties. If you could invite three people, dead or alive, famous, to your house for dinner, who would you have? Who would you invite? When I thought about it, I thought I'd have have Michael McIntyre, because he'd bring all the laughs. I'd have Stephen Fry, because he'd bring the conversation. And I'd have... David Beckham, because we're going to become best friends one day. He just doesn't know it yet. I wonder who you'd invite to have to dinner at yours. We're in this little series at the moment called Prosper. And when the Bible talks about prospering, it's saying it's about when God's people, when Christians, when they genuinely live the way that God wants them to live. And today we're thinking about God's community, the church, and learning to to be that community. And I think that when God's community is at its best, our neighbourhoods rejoice because uh, we're a real blessing to them. One of the best symbols in church life for what the church is, is a meal that we celebrate on a regular occasion. We call it either the Lord's Supper or communion. Some traditions call it the Eucharist. But it's this meal where we 
we share bread and we share generally wine together. In fact, we're going to be celebrating it afterwards today. And it's at this meal where we learn how to be the community that God wants us to be. Let me read a a brilliant story about it because this illustrates the point so well. This is from a book of the Bible called Corinthians. The Corinthians were, it was an area, but it was a particular church group and they they did not have it all together. Always falling out, always in trouble. But this is what um, the Apostle Paul wrote as he spoke to them. In the following directives, I have no praise for you. For your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you. And to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have been differences among you to show which of you has God's approval. So then, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For when you are eating, some of you go ahead with your own private suppers. As a result, one one person remains hungry and another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God by humiliating those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this matter. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat the bread and drink from the cup. For those who eat and drink without discerning the body of Christ eat and drink judgment on themselves. It's so interesting to me that this important meal, that Paul talks about it right in the heart of a community whose behavior is all over the place. I can remember in the church community that I grew up in, whenever we shared communion together, I'd hear conversations after we'd finished the service where the adults would say things like, oh, did you see so-and-so, so-and-so today? They were, they were eating communion. Do you think they should be eating communion? Or did you notice that so-and-so didn't eat communion today? And there was all this kind of gossip about who should and who shouldn't. And I kind of think, how can you treat this important meal in this way? But it's the point of the meal. It's a table that's at the heart of the community and its purpose that Jesus gave it to us as a practice to do so on a regular basis because he knew that in that meal we would remember him, we'd remember his teaching, we'd remember what he was about, we'd remember the fact that he died for us, we'd remember what was at the heart of his community and that that would shape us. In first century Palestine, in the community, in the culture that Jesus was operating in them, uh, tables or the, the dining table of the day was like a microcosm of society. Who you ate with was of high importance. And for a group of people called the Pharisees, uh, for them it was so important who they were being seen to eat with. Who you ate with, where you sat at the table, these were such important social matters. And the Pharisees thought of their dining tables as little temples. They only wanted people at the table to share meals with them who had made themselves clean. People who were ritually pure. If you ate with the wrong people, you yourself could get excluded from the worshipping community. There was an old joke in those days that said sinners were about as welcome at the table of a Pharisee as pork sausages at a bar mitzvah. So if you were were a sinner, you had no chance of being at the table. Jesus, on the other hand, 
he gained a reputation for who he shared meals with. His table was a microcosm of the kind of community, the kind of society that he came to restore, to bring. Who he ate with indicated who was welcome and what he wanted this community to be like and how he wanted them to live in order to share or invite others into that community. This is from Matthew's Gospel. It says, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? You see, Jesus was inviting people to the table that the Pharisees never would. Jesus had come to restore and recreate our world and the religious system of the day had pushed people away. And Jesus engaged so many of these people that were called sinners. Sinners is a term some of us use nowadays for anyone who does anything wrong. But in Jesus' day, a sinner was specifically people that have been excluded from the temple, if you like, excluded from the church community because there was something wrong with them or because they were a certain person in society. And so they couldn't get in. But what Jesus did, if you read his stories, is he took the temple and its worship and its culture to them. He went and met with tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and lepers and he found them where they were and made sure that they knew they were included. John's Gospel says, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I was reflecting on that this week and I thought, how do we best understand then what it means to prosper as a community? How do we learn to be the community, the church that God wants us to be? Particularly in the times we find ourselves in now when we can't gather in quite the same way. And I thought about it around three tables. The first table is the communion table. At this table, God hosts us. We are invited by God to this table, to this meal. If you've ever been invited out to dinner, if you're ever invited to somebody else's table for a sit-down meal, it'll often expose your own insecurities. You're worried about where you should sit at the table. You're worried about whether you'll make mistakes, pick up the wrong cutlery or whatever it is. You're worried as to whether you'll remember those manners that your mum taught you. Eating can bring you face to face actually with your own insecurities with who you are the communion table brings us it brings us into the presence of jesus our host we remember when we're at that communion table who he is his life the way he treated others the way he died for us the way on one occasion he even washed his disciples' feet. And when you're in his presence, remembering those things as you hold the bread and you drink the wine, it shapes you if you let it. It'll shape who you are. Because in his presence, we become aware of our own selfishness, our own faults. We become aware that we don't love others in the way that he loved us. But we're also reminded in that meal despite how the church does it sometimes, we can be reminded that he welcomes us. He loves us. He forgives us. And he wants to restore us. And so at the communion table, we're reminded of this this Jesus who invites us in and realizes we're not worthy to be there, but does not make us feel uncomfortable. But he shapes us and molds us. And so for me, over many, many years now as a Christian, I've been at that table so many times. And it's been at that table that I've been shaped to this point in my life, both individually and as part of the church. But then there's the second table. 
It's the dining table, our dining tables. No matter how big, small they are, just at home, it may sometimes be simply that little tray you put on your lap as you sit in the lounge because you don't have room for a physical table. But at this table, we host others. We learn to host others, and we learn that, that Christ is present at those tables as well. And we have the opportunity, whether we're hosting one or two friends, whether it's our family unit, we have the opportunity to give people a taste of heaven. There's a fantastic story in, uh, in Mark's account, Mark's gospel of the life of Jesus, where hundreds of people are coming to hear Jesus and they're looking for answers in life about what's the purpose of life? What's it all about? What does this teacher, this rabbi, this Jesus, what does he have to say? And um, the disciples are noticing, Jesus' followers are noticing what's going on and they notice that they're hungry. It's been a long day. And so they come to Jesus and they say, we need to send them home, we need to send them home. But Jesus turns it on them and he says, well, you give them something to eat. And they've got no idea how. So Jesus says, as it were, well, go and see what's in the cupboard. Not literally, but go and see what's out there. They find this one lad who's got five small loaves and, and two sardines. And for the disciples, they're like, well, we can't do anything with this. What difference can we make with that? But Jesus takes these ordinary things and he makes them extraordinary. And he feeds everybody till their stomachs are full and they are fully satisfied. I think often we feel like, I can't invite people around my table. Who am I to share Christ with others? And what Jesus wants to teach us is, take who you are and what you have, limited though it might be, but come with the right heart and offer it to others. And through that, my presence will come into that situation and I will make a difference. I wonder at the moment whether God is doing something in his church, not just ours here in this neighborhood, but around the world, whether there's a sense in which we've been taken away from being able to have communion at the communion table, but we can meet around our own tables in small numbers, but maybe as a practice it restores something in us as a church. Then there's the third table. Now this table, there's a number of them, but they're tables that we find in different parts of life. It may be the desk at work. It may be the table at the pub where you meet your friends. It may be that coffee table in your favorite coffee shop. This is where others host us. This is their environment. Their territory, as it were. This is where they feel comfortable, but where they might invite us into conversation with them. There's another story in, in the life of Jesus where on one occasion he sends out 72 of his followers into the neighborhood around them. And he says to them, wait to be invited in. Wait till they invite you in to have conversation with them. And it's at these tables uh, where they... They, they serve others by the way in which they share their lives with them. It's here where they, they display Jesus' character to others. I think we live in a world that, that hungers for connection, but they can't find what they're looking for. People want deep connection, deep fellowship. And we learn at the communion table what it means to be accepted, what it means to be listened to, what it means to be loved. And then what Jesus calls us to do is to take that same, that same love and share it with people who are looking for it. Here in the middle of everyday life, we can share church with others, where we experience at the communion table healing and forgiveness and reconciliation. It may be that there at the coffee table, the desk, we help people with their hurts, their hang-ups, their resentments. This is why... As church, we have to extend what we experience at the communion table to our dining tables and to those other tables we find in those different spaces. And as they host us, that we look for the opportunity where Jesus might want to break into those conversations. A friend of mine was telling me his table story just the other day. It was a story from his own church, and it kind of illustrates the point of these three tables today. 
This guy, a guy in his 50s, he'd injured his back seriously when he was living in London. And he'd come back to live in Salford. Uh, it's back in 2014. And at the time, what he did was he came into the church's coffee shop, table number three, sat at the coffee table, and he noticed in the conversations that people didn't gossip about one another. His back got worse and he was confined to home for a while. He got a bit better, came back to the coffee shop, got to know people better. Then he found out that the coffee shop was part of a church community and they invited him to come and share life with them and he got invited into one or two of their homes to have meals with them there. Table number two. After a short while, they got to know him better and eventually he joined them when they gathered for service on a Sunday and he shared communion with them. Table number one. And not long after, he gave his life to Christ and became a Christian. I think God is calling his church to prosper again as a community. And I think we are called to be that loving community. And we discover what it means to be that communion, uh, that, that community at the communion table. And we take it from there to our dining tables and into all those other tables where we find that we can experience Christ's presence and we can share Christ's presence with others. So may we, as we go out into this week, may we prosper as a community, even in the times we find ourselves in, as we look to be hospitable towards others around our various tables where we find ourselves. Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin, Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar, the Father's arms are and mistakes come today there's no reason to wait Jesus is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh oh come to Christ is risen.
And so we come to communion, to this table number one that Steve was talking about. This place where we gather as God's community to share fellowship with one another and to be hosted by God himself. As Jesus stood at that meal in that upper room with his disciples, his friends and those who would betray him, he called people into this meal. And so to, to, to draw us in today to this simple meal, uh, I want to use some words that uh, some people might find familiar, but this invitation is always open. It's never shut off. There's nothing we could have done. There's nowhere we could have been last night, nothing we could have said this morning that means that this table is not open to us. And there was power in this table. There is power in a simple meal of breaking bread together whether we're physically together or just we are joining together as our as our place in the body of Christ it says come to this table not because you must but because you may not because you are strong but because you are weak come not because any goodness of your own give you a right to come but because you need mercy and help. Come because you love the Lord a little and would like to love him more. Come because he loved you and gave himself for you. Come and meet the risen Christ, for we are his body. And so on on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he gathered with his friends in an upper room, And what he did is he took some bread and he said, look, this is my body. It will be broken for you. And maybe we as his body has his church. We feel at the moment that we too are broken into pieces and scattered in different places. There might be those that we used to feel tight-knit with and close to. And yet now we feel that we are spread out or even just scattered out into the world. And yet this meal reflects a body that is broken for us. Reflects this Jesus who says, no matter how broken, no matter how smashed up, No matter how torn apart we might feel, because of my death and my resurrection, there is a way through it. There is always hope. And therefore, as we, like these these scattered pieces of bread, we too feel scattered from one another. We know that in this meal, we come together. Our identity is as the wholeness of that body together. This bread will never stop being that bread just because it has been broken into pieces. So let me pray and lead us into this simple meal. Lord Jesus, I thank you 
for your presence, for your love, for your body and your blood. Lord, that even as we are broken as a, as a community, even as we are maybe isolated and cut off from those we would love to see, Lord, it doesn't affect our identity as being one in you, as being made as your body, your church, your community, to bring hope and joy and peace and gentleness and kindness and all the, the fruits of the Spirit into this world. And so, Jesus, as we are scattered, as we are split apart, Father, would we know our identity in you as your body, as your people, as your presence? And maybe even in our brokenness, we meet with you in yours. Father, may these, these elements, this, this bread and this wine or water or tea or coffee or whatever we are using this morning, Lord Jesus, would we meet with you, the risen Lord. Amen. And so this body that is broken, this this cup which is a sign of a new covenant a new way of being a new identity in jesus we eat and drink this simple meal at this table table number one as being the grounding of who we are and everything we do out in the world comes out of this so in a moment we're going to eat and we're going to drink together as, as Jackson plays and as we, we hum or, or murmur along, or maybe even sing if you're by yourself, I encourage you to eat this bread, to drink this, this water, this fruit juice, this tea, this coffee, whatever you've got with you. It might not even be bread, might be biscuits, it might be whatever you have in your cupboards. But we recognise our identity in Jesus as his body together, even when we feel broken and so Jesus broke the bread he took the cup he said eat and drink for whenever you do you proclaim my name until I come again or until I put all things back together amen Our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father, I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Oh. Defender, suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe. Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in you. I believe Christ is 
I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name of Jesus. For I believe in the name encouraging everyone to choose someone to explore our talks with and discuss what stood out to you. We're also connecting on Zoom from 11.15 and we'll be celebrating ND's induction into ministry and that will then be followed by youth church sessions. So we'll see you there. But if you're watching this midweek, don't worry, we'll see you again on Sunday. <laughs>